Hello, everybody. Well, a big shout out to all of our participants. Um, this is an OER Hangout brought to you by CORAL, the folks at CORAL, the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning at the University of Texas at Austin. And today we have, a, my name is Carl Blythe. I'm the director of CORAL. Uh, we have uh, Sarah and Natalie who will also be joining us and, and working the phones as they say, not really, but looking at the chat room and helping us with all the technical issues. Um, and before I introduce our speakers today, I wanna to say that I'm really excited about the talk uh, and our, the topic because using students in the development of materials has become a big thing. Uh, it's big in OER land and the development of OER, and it makes a ton of sense. Um, we want our materials to be um, student friendly and what better way than to have our students actually be members of the developmental team. And so today we have two groups of, of people um, from Boise State and from Virginia Commonwealth University talking about their projects. And I don't have a lot more to say because both of them will be discussing that uh, and kind of what they're doing. Kelly Arispe and Amber Hoy from Boise State are gonna go first. Uh, as I said, they are gonna talk about a project that is really about a repository that they've created at their university. The foreign language faculty, as I understand it, are joining together to create then these different objects. And somehow they're incorporating their students. And they're going to talk for about 10 minutes. And after that, then uh, we'll give it over to the team at Virginia Commonwealth. And Catherine and her colleagues will talk to you also about their project, which incorporates grad, uh, undergraduates at different levels in really interesting ways, kind of playing different roles. Okay, so Kelly and Amber, the floor is yours. Great. Thank Wonderful. You. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you for your time and joining us today. And so we just want to share with you our presentation for today. So we thought it would be helpful if we can provide some visuals to walk you through this. Our goal is to talk to you a little bit about how um, we got to this place of creating a pathways repository of open educational resources uh, for foreign language teaching faculty and how we incorporated our students in that process. So I'll be mm -hmm. talking about the mission and the growth and, and why we got here. And then Amber's gonna talk a little bit more about yeah, all the nitty gritty, the, the logistics, how how it, how do you hire students? How do we, do we compensate them? All those kinds of things. Yeah, so we hope that's helpful. And certainly, um, please, we will be very dependent upon all of your great questions mm -hmm. after. So um, first and foremost, there's two um, principal uh, points of departure for us in, in the context of Boise State University and specifically um, within our department and the state of Idaho. Um, there's been a large culture shift in our department, as you can imagine, as uh, pedagogy has gone much more in the, in the direction of communicative language teaching. And we really wanted to have the lab um, portion of um, the curriculum, specifically at the lower division levels mm -hmm. um, for our undergraduate students. We wanted that to be in line with um, CLT. And so Amber's gonna be talking about how she was able to leverage that in conjunction with our conversation assistants mm -hmm. and through um, a variety of means. Um, so that was the first uh, impetus. And then the second, in my role as program coordinator for our teacher education um, program with our secondary students in French, German, and Spanish, um, I've been part of the content and teacher enhancement standards revision at the state of Idaho. And in 2015 and 2016, those took major shifts in terms of uh, lining to national standards, which was a very positive turn. But you can imagine that puts a lot of onus on our K through 12 instructors to all of a sudden um, shift what they've been doing in their practice. And so we thought it was a opportune time to be able to create a space where we could bring lots of people into the fold um, to, uh, to create classroom ready materials that could support both of those um, missions. And so um, the, the repository, we call it Pathways, um, is really chock full of 500 plus classroom ready materials. So they are from start to finish, they include a warm up, a cool down, um, they're innovative, so um, we like to think that they're aligned to best practices mm -hmm. in world language teaching. They promote principally interpersonal speaking activities because we found, and certainly through my research, 
um, that that is often a pressure point for a lot of our K through 12 instructors, mm -hmm. as well as for some of our adjunct faculty. We rely heavily on our adjunct faculty specifically for our lower division uh, courses. And so while it's one thing to provide professional development opportunities, oftentimes the big barrier is in that time and how can they create activities that are gonna leverage those best practices. And so really this is a repository that serves um, K through 16 uh, world language classrooms. And we, um, we also recognize that, you know, the speaking is something that our students desperately need. And so we wanted to um, really support that. And obviously, we, uh, we come from a very rural state, <laughs> so it really matters to us that the language teachers that are especially in rural areas feel that they're supported, but not only from this top-down approach, but they're invited to participate. And so we really espouse an open pedagogy um, framework. We believe that's missional and a social justice mindset. Um, of allowing everybody a seat at the table um, and everybody has something to offer and we're going to really focus on that student uh, focus today but um, but we can also get in if there's questions about what that looks like for uh, rural areas mm -hmm. too. So it might be helpful to talk a little bit about who is involved in this community and, and I'll explain the, the role. So I'm the director of our Language Research Center and Pathways kind of had its impetus or it's kind of its um, kicking off point in our, um, our language resource center, like Kelly mentioned. So all of our lower level courses have 30 minute conversation labs and we were working really hard to make the best out of those 30 minutes and really make them fruitful, make sure that students were having um, ample time to practice speaking. And what we did is we started to develop these activities like Kelly mentioned, so that they have a warm up, a main activity, they have a cool down, and rather than just keep them to ourselves, we decided why not share these with the, the faculty at our university, with our community college partners, other universities here in Idaho, but why don't we also share those with our K through 12 partners? So you can see here, we have quite, um, quite a, a large variety of, of different roles in, in our community, but I think what Kelly mentioned is really important is that everyone has an equal role, everyone has something to contribute, um, and especially our students. Mm -hmm. um, so I think on the next slide, I can, I'll, we'll talk a little bit about the breakdown of that. Yeah. Uh, but who are our students? I think this is helpful to know. So we have students from all different backgrounds, um, but we do have we do have a threshold. So yeah. um, we ask that our students be at the advanced level in terms of their oral proficiency. Um, many of our students are secondary ed majors, and, and this is really great experience for them before they get into the classroom. Um, we have many heritage and native speakers who are working with us, um, students that are taking language courses or students that are even volunteering. They're here to learn English here at Boise state and they want to donate their time. We have a vertically integrated project that I'll talk a little bit more about, um, but not anyone can can join. We do have a, a, a threshold. Quality, we quality have quality control, control yeah. in place um, and there's there's training that takes place and, and there's really kind of an informal interview that, that takes place before we um, let someone join the, the project or the community. Sarah, how are we doing on time? Can you just show me with your fingers how many more minutes we have so we can make sure we're doing okay? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so um, the, the, the students who really are, are working to create many of these activities are conversation assistants. So like we mentioned before, we have these conversation labs each week and they're, they're actually a flipped approach. So the students aren't um, participating online. They actually come to our lab face to face. We've actually ironically gotten rid of a lot of our computers and we've tried to, to turn our conversation lab into more of a gathering space, if you will. So the conversation assistants, not only do they lead these um, 30 minute conversation labs, but they're actively working to create the activities. Um, and that's really great too, because students when they're when they're creating the activities they have a better idea than, than Kelly and myself for example of what's going to be interesting to students what's really mm -hmm. going to hook their attention for those 30 minutes what are some of the cultural antidotes that might be you know kind of shocking or interesting or thought-provoking um, so they work to create the um, activities with the oversight of myself and then also the language teachers here in our department um, this semester, I was also fortunate enough to hire two OER editors, and that's actually very cool because those students don't necessarily have high degree of language proficiency, 
but they're able to bring in other skill sets. So one of our OER editors has a background in technical communication, and she's really working to strengthen our instructions for the activities. Um, another one is interested in psychology and biology, and but again, has a passion for language and is there to really help with the quality control. Um, so that's something that we're doing this semester too, to really bring in an outside perspective. These students haven't necessarily facilitated the activities, so they're really able to bring a critical eye and make sure any, any teacher who does that activity is really going to be able to understand how to facilitate it in their classroom. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then do you want me to talk yeah, about sure, the vertically? So the vertically integrated project and the OER grant are, um, are, are, are large projects that are going on here at Boise State. The vertically integrated project um, is not something that's specific to Boise State, but it definitely is um, in line with the innovation that is very important at our institution and uh, specifically it's housed within the College of Innovation and Design, but it supports programs like ours that really want to engage students outside of just their major to make interdisciplinary connections and to be able to tell their story about what they're gaining from their language major in terms of skill set so that they can bridge the gap um, for that career that they hope to attain on the other end of graduation and in at the same by the same measure it's a way for them to partner with faculty and research um, in research projects and so you can imagine from my perspective um, as someone who's an applied linguist I get to partner with these students I don't just see them for one semester they continue on with me and Amber mm -hmm. as supervisors in this project um, for multiple semesters and we can see a project like this OER pathways repository really come to fruition in a quality um, way and do some really neat uh, types of projects where undergraduate students are involved in both the research and the creation yeah. and the skill set. And then the other thing that's been really great and supportive at Boise State is that our provost's office um, has been very generous in providing OER grant um, monies to support this. And so we just um, received a small OER grant and we were able to provide stipends for lead teachers, three of whom are um, here in our department and teach lower division um, German, Japanese, and ASL, and then two that come from our community and are uh, secondary teachers teaching Spanish and French. And the goal there is that they would provide language expertise and that they can look at these activities created by students, ensure that there is indeed good quality target language use, mm -hmm. and then they can also look at um, the way the activity is built and ensure that it is actually feasible for their classroom mm -hmm. and for their classroom environment. And so this is a, a specific example where thanks to those funds, um, we've been able to uh, really uh, bring more partners to the table mm -hmm. and um, and certainly being able to participate in this webinar is a huge um, support to us in, in this project. So thank you. I think that that concludes um, this is just more uh, more examples of the, the products. I think we already kind of went over this, but mm -hmm. in terms of what you'll find for those of you that are curious after um, after this webinar, you can tinker on and look at uh, the, the repository and all the activities and you're going to find um, that there's and this, yeah, this is our trajectory. Standard. So right now there's a an abundance of interpersonal speaking activities, yeah. um, but in the coming year there'll be a lot more listening and reading activities. There's also on our website peer to peer resources. So our students are not only helping us to create activities for the classroom, yeah. but they're also really interested in the, this idea of recruitment and retention of language students. So this semester we have students who are working to create products to help support students who are studying abroad, really yeah. giving them the resources to be successful, and then also to help recruit high school seniors and um, college freshmen as well. And um, video exemplars are something that are also coming. It's part of Kelly's research. Yeah, it's from my research um, so. But that's another thing that we see is that oftentimes it's one thing to read an activity, but if you've never actually seen this activity implemented, how, how does, what does it look like? How do you, um, wh where's the classroom management um, piece of this? How do you make sure that it's successful when you actually do it with your students? And mm -hmm. so we're, gonna, we're really excited to, to start bringing that to the repository as well. Yeah, and so I guess to conclude, all of these things, both the mission, the product, the process, right, is our, our ultimate goal is that we would provide a community where whereby students are absolutely at the center. It's very learner-centered. These are topics and interests, and it's really driven by what they desire out of a language classroom and in terms of intercultural competence and all that. The, the, the bread and butter of what we do as language instructors and that they're partnering in the, in the ideation and the creation of these activities with um, the very language experts themselves and the teachers themselves. So 
Um, I think that's it. Um, that's a simple URL that you can uh, use. And Amber, you said that there's yeah, a Yeah, so we, um, we have a form right on the front of it. And if you'd like to, you can put your information there. If, even if you're disinterested in finding out more what we have to offer, yeah. if you're interested in getting involved or contributing an activity, there's different levels of involvement there. But um, we would love for you to add your name and email so we can um, send you some more information if you're interested. Okay, great. great. I'm going to now turn it over to Catherine, but this is a good time for me to tell everybody who's listening, please, as your questions come up, uh, type them in the chat room, and then we will get to them after Catherine uh, and her colleagues' presentation. Okay? Um, and while they're gathering their thoughts, I just want to say uh, that was a great, I, uh, the presentation we just heard from Boise State, um, materials become so much more than what we tend to think of them. They're no longer just a textbook or then the kind of static content. I was writing down then like ideas that community of practice, the, the materials become this nexus or a catalyst for so many different things. It's a social network, a professional network because it's attached to their careers, a community of practice because you've got all these kids who are doing all these cool things, teaching each other. So I love it, it's great. Thank okay, you. so um, that was the Pathways Project again from Boise State. And just to let you know, boisestate.edu slash worldlang slash pathways. Okay, Catherine, it's your turn. What, what's going on at Virginia Commonwealth? Okay, well, thank you so very much. And I'm going to push this back a little bit because I would like to introduce my colleagues who are here with me today. And uh, I don't know if you're seeing the whole thing, but at any rate, I'm Catherine Murphy Judy, and my name is Miguel Dorelli. I'm an adjunct faculty of French and librarian at Virginia Commonwealth University. I'm Laura Middlebrooks, coordinator of the Spanish program here at VCU. So I'm just going to kind of quickly give you an overview of what we've been working on. It's a multi-phasic project where we started five years ago with a problem, and the problem was that. Um, the faculty didn't like teaching the 202 level, which is second year, second semester, and the students by and large weren't liking it either. So we had a, a problem. And one of the major reasons why it's, such, it's been such a difficult course is because it's the end of um, a requirement for certain majors. And so we have probably two thirds of the students who this is just a requirement, they wanna check the box and get on to graduation. But we have a third who are going on, and this is a linchpin course for them if they're going on for a major or a mi minor. And so there was just um, a lot going on in the course that made it really hard to teach, hard to learn. So faculty got together, at first it was faculty, and we said, what can we do that would get students more engaged in this? and give them maybe some other skills and uh, content that even if they're not going on for a major or a minor in a language, that they would have something that would be super useful coming out of this. So we looked at the notion of curations and we started with a curation project where our students go out and curate within themes that are typical for the 202 level, but they find what they're interested in, in that thematic. Um, and then we started using the curations. From that we moved on, but I'll explain that all in just a second. But eventually now we've gotten to e-textbooks and along the way we really started integrating a lot more of the students into helping us find materials, produce materials, and eventually to produce the um, e-textbooks that we're doing. So given what the, the topic is of, of this hangout, um, the student-faculty collaboration is really what has become the heart and soul and driving force behind this project. So um, as I said, we started with curations, and this is sort of weird. It starts over on the left and then it circles around to the right, so it's counterclockwise. But it starts with the students in the 202 course who are doing curations. They're the 202 students. We have them then using the curations in virtual exchanges with native speakers so that they're talking about what they're curating um, with people who are native speakers and who have 
uh, an authentic reaction and interpretation of what's going on. So there's a lot of really good exchange comes from that. We brought in, if we keep on moving over to three, we brought in upper level students to work with us who help us build OER modules. Um, and then from there, we've moved into having those same upper level students helping us build the e-textbooks that are then used in the 200 level. And it's constantly circulating and sustainable because we're always creating new modules that um, are then going into the e-textbook, which is a modular design so that faculty and students together can decide what it is that they find relevant, interesting, and um, of the moment. So um, this, and since me, Guidarelli's class is up there at 201, I'm going to have, have me maybe talk really quickly about how she's had her students do curations. Well, uh, basically, we, I asked them you know, to surf the web and search you know, uh, topics that would be of interest to them. And then they would you know, summarize, summarize you know, the uh, contents of that site and um, add keywords. And later, I would use the same this selection on the creation project to uh, do an expose, a uh, lengthier presentation uh, at the end of the semester to tease out more details about their presentation on just uh, the site. And we use WordPress to do this creation project. Uh, we also ask the students to evaluate and rate you know, their, uh, the choice of their classmates. All righty. So the curations, as you can see, is sort of it's it's a big open open yeah. site, right. um, and we use it not only at the two hundred two level, but we have some of the other levels who have decided that yeah. they really like the idea of having their students curate and um, then have this uh, uh, archive where students can go and look at different things that are interesting. Um, the virtual exchanges. We either have students doing teletandem where we set up between two classrooms um, and then the students are discussing, uh, usually it's like 30 minutes in English, 30 minutes in the target language. And so they exchange information based on uh, my students are working on what they've curated and the students from the other class, we have one, um, one classroom that is from EFEC, which is a Belgian uh, business school. And so those students are working on business topics. And so the, the exchange is fine, it, it works. Um, but we also sometimes use Talk Abroad, which is a paid service. And when it's Talk Abroad, I set up the topics that the students will be working on. But by and large, they're getting to talk about what they're curating and about how they're interpreting their curations and the like. Um, so then we have taken the curations, as me was saying, we do a triage of those that have gotten the most student likes or stars. And then faculty and upper level students, we build scaffolded modules to go with it. This is one that was built on a rap song by Yusufa. Uh, in French, and you can see their learning outcomes, their pre-readings, readings, and then post-readings. And um, then because those are iframed, we can just drag them into the press book, which is what we've been creating as our um, e-textbook. And I'm going to quickly go on with this. Um, the e-textbook we set up with students, and it, for right now it has five units, but unit zero doesn't really count. I mean, it does, but it's, it's the orientation unit. It really helps them learn how to curate. It, learns, it, it helps them learn how to use LinguaFolio. And I was really excited to see that um, Kelly and Amber were talking about LinguaFolio and using can-do statements because that's how we frame the work that our students are going to be doing in the, each unit. So the unit zero, they learn how to use LinguaFolio online, which is out of Castles. And um, then the next unit is all about the self and identity. They, they work on that, have uh, different uh, 
can do's that they that that the the faculty member gets to choose which and together with the students they choose what the can do's are that they'll be working on and um, the unit two is about self and others so it's getting into dialogic exchange unit three is the context for communication so it can be either local or global or global and then unit four we have the students take what they're learning in the language and interculturality and push it into their professional futures um, and this is just a little bit more about how each of the units are set up and what I'd like to do right now is have Laura talk to us because right now she's teaching Spanish 202, which is the fourth semester in our um, beginning and intermediate sequence. And I'd just like to share with you one anecdote. On the first day of the semester, I announced to my students, of course, in the target language that there was no $250 textbook that was required for the course. And immediately there was a visceral reaction among my students. They sat up in their chairs, they looked at one another and leaned forward <clears throat> and became instantly more engaged because they were hearing an instructor saying, the faculty understand what it's like to be a student to be struggling with finances. And many of our students not only study full-time at BCU, they also work part-time and some students work full-time. Mm -hmm. So they are, they are juggling a lot and finances are very tight. So when students are aware that faculty have made this choice, keeping the student needs in mind, it changes the entire dynamic of the course. Um, part of what we do throughout the work is evaluate what the students are thinking of it, because this is all about the students. Um, when we're working with the upper level students, there's a constant dialogue that's going on. But with the 202 students throughout the semester, they're there are these kind of exchanges going on. And I just wanted to share with you, this was from the spring semester when I used Atelier Réel in a French course. Um, the students didn't particularly like the introductory unit, so we've been working on how to fix that so that the unit zero um, is something that's a little bit more engaging. What they do really like are the texts and videos that show language in use. And that's very much a part of uh, each unit as it starts out with something very topical. Um, and it, the students who are working with us in the upper level students have told us that, yes, this is engaging. So it might be something on hashtag me too. It might be something on immigration, but it's what students are really talking about right now. They also really like the grammatical and lex lexical scaffolding that we put in there. And that scaffolding is to help them as they're working on their curations. And we see that they need some additional help, perhaps in um, the pluperfect tense or something that they're just not quite getting. Yeah. We can slide that in, uh, have it a part of the unit that they're working on so that they can interpret what they're reading better. But also because they're doing so much production we can work with them and say, what do you need in order to be able to have interpersonal conversations about this? What do you need in order to do presentational oral work on this? What do you need in order to have presentational work, uh, written work on this? So we're able to scaffold them where they need it um, rather than us starting the unit by saying, we're gonna work on the subjunctive. We work on the subjunctive if they need the subjunctive. Um, so at any rate, those are at least some of the answers that we had gotten from them. And I asked the question, did the Atelier Real materials support the learning goals for each unit? And I think it's pretty good to have 80% of them who said yes, yeah. and you know the other 20% maybe, but there wasn't a single student who said that the, the materials that we have built together don't support their learning goals. They know what their learning goals are, Thank, thanks in great measure to uh, Linguafolio. Um, 
but then they, they know that the materials are really supporting their learning uh, for, for their learning needs. So um, this is just a picture. These are two of the students who, were, who have helped us put this together. And that was two summers ago as we actually built the four units. They were there with us building what the four units would look like. They're with us building the modules um, and the OER units. And uh, what I love about the students is they're really honest because we may be geeking out and say, oh, this is so cool. Oh, look at this subjunctive. Oh, man. And the students will go, oh, no, 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 no. And they put a real reality quotient back into um, our creation and development. Um, and the students have pretty much as we're there framing with pedagogical notions mm -hmm. yeah. and with pragmatics of what needs to be done because we're the content people, but they're the ones who are telling us how students are learning now and what they're interested in now. Yeah. So they're really pretty much in charge and have a lot to say about it. Um, we do have an article or you know, a chapter in a book that came out recently. Uh, their link is there for anyone who'd like to go and read it. Um, and it explains a lot more of what we've uh, talked about here today. And so those are questions. Those are, and I'm sorry I didn't get Laura's no, email, yeah. but it's middlebrooks at vcu.edu. So anyway, that's ours. Thank and you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. That's really terrific. Um, but so we're going to turn to the questions right now. I just want to make a comment that came to my mind um, as Natalie and, and Sarah are going to help us read through the, 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 the questions there. But um, so it's kind of from these virtual exchanges, telecollaboration that gives the input to this triage process that gives the input to the text, e textbook kind of. I like how um, they're all engaged in different processes, but doing different things. And what, what it made me think of is the idea that I keep talking about, and that is that materials are an applied form of scholarship. So those of us who do, who are into OER or even just materials development, um, I think that it's really important for our colleagues and other people to understand that these are not just easy things to do. There's a process and, um, I think Kelly mentioned earlier on quality control. We want to have quality content and it takes time and it takes effort. And that was clearly um, the, the notion of triage. Some of this stuff doesn't, is not going to make it in. Yeah, no, right, it right, doesn't. Right, right. <laughs> That's really very important that you've got to have some kind of built in quality control. Um, and that comes back to this notion that they're learning a lot. So in the digital humanities world, they talk about, um, they talk about generative scholarship, scholarship that you can create with your students. And so I think that this, both of these projects capture that, that they're learning a lot, well beyond just what we typically think of in a foreign language classroom. Like um, at Boise State, the OER editors are adding something, they're adding lots of things. Okay, so let's get to some of the questions. A question about quality control. Um, and she didn't quite understand, and frankly, I didn't either, the notion of quality control and, and the Pathways Project. Sure. What did you mean? Could you just expound a little, expand a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. When we gave this presentation uh, at Calico for the teacher ed SIG, I started with prescriptivism is alive and well, uh, for better or worse. And so sometimes when we put materials out uh, in an open way, right? There's instructors and professors who are well-intentioned um, and are concerned sometimes to see mistakes that uh, upper division, even advanced level students will make. And that's part of the development process as applied linguists. We can certainly speak to that as very normal. Um, and yet, how do we ensure that if this is branded from a department, from a language right, uh, program, that we are not inhibiting the process for the lear very learners that are consuming these materials. And so um, the quality control came from, from that concern is how do we ensure that, and I think that's where the teachers really can join in because we have so many teachers who may not 
understand right now how to leverage a communicative um, interpersonal speaking activity, that actually is a big ask for somebody who's been in the field for 20 plus years mm -hmm. and has seen their entire discipline do a 180, um, but they sure know how to take a product and polish it. And <laughs> they can provide some, not only from a grammatical standpoint, they can provide lexical variation, vocabulary, right? These these very beautiful um, expressions that may be in their own language variation, uh, they can they can provide an input that's meaningful, and so that's how we have tried to engage um, engage that. We found that the o we do OPIs um, in our in our specifically in our Spanish program. We have a, an OPI at the beginning and at the end, but also um, in our French and German, we have one at the end, and so. Which, and then, of course, our, um, our teacher educators have to do an OPI for certification. And so that's a measure that we found has been helpful and, um, and just ensuring that they indeed are at a level where they can use the language uh, fluently and consistently with what we believe is important for those inputs. And, and to follow up with that, I think we've really tried to take a proactive approach. So yeah. on all the activities everywhere on our website, we have kind of a, a yeah. blurb at the top that just says, hey, these activities are a foundation. We yeah. need your collaboration we, and we welcome and we want that uh, in order for these activities to really become their polished form. They are, they're proofread, they're, but they're not perfect. And so I, I think that's cool because it really does, like Kelly said, give every, every teacher a role. Yeah. If they're not the one who's actively creating the activity, they can still absolutely help us get to that polished form and really contribute. Mm -hmm. um, and then also really trying to partner the students up when they're creating the activities yeah. is another strategy that I have. So everyone um, on the team has either, they have a go-to person to go for for proofreading, whether that be one of our heritage or native speakers, or whether that be one of the, the teachers um, who are working us, with us in those little mini grants that we talked about. Yeah, yeah. So um, I have a question that goes to this notion of open materials, which are, and kind of what we're talking about right now, there is an expectation by teachers that you have a, in a commercial text perfect it's been vetted yeah. it costs a lot of money and it's very expensive but the whole point of oer is that we can open it up to community and reduce the cost but that means that essentially that that they're always in the process of becoming right, right? So you're going like this yes and so that's a mind shift again yeah. mm -hmm. you're talking about that that people have to understand right. that communication itself is always ongoing and that so the the metaphor, the negotiation, the meaning is really yes. embedded in these materials. Absolutely. Um, they're not finished products. They're always ongoing. Absolutely. So my question to you is, wow, that, that's a lot of work because that means that you're constantly editing or updating. Is that, is that what you're doing? Well, that's a great question. And I think Amber touched on it. We realized that we didn't do when we first started this, by the way, open education OER is constantly a learning experience. It's humbling to be on the creating side and trying to supervise that. So it does take a little bit of um, courage to put yourself out there in that way. Um, but I think Amber, what we learned and something that we needed to do was to get in front of uh, anybody consuming our activities to see that this indeed is an iterative process and it is very process centered in the sense that if you see a mistake, don't just criticize it, correct it. We engage you and we invite you to be part of this. And it, it is, we, nothing is free, right? And so if, if, you want, if you want to be able to use these materials, you're going to then have to, to be a little bit, yeah, you have to be a little bit either more flexible when you see something that's not as polished as you have in your standard, which is fair, or you can also engage in, uh, with us in a different way. So it, it is a mind shift. It's a mindset that has to evolve, um, but it is definitely, I feel, missional to what we have to do in higher education to meet the needs of our students. Um, and so those are, yeah, but getting in front of that communication, I think, um, for because now that it's open, it's accessible for anyone, not just in the state of Idaho. We hope that you know people across across the country will want to use these activities. They're for educators, and so um, just letting people know that this is not a textbook that is an editorial, you know, board that can go in and find every single right. It's there's differences there. So, what about the VCU materials? Are they also open to the general public? 
that they are, um, as it stands right now, the, uh, like the Atelier Réal, um, it is open, people can get into it, but we don't have it in a form yet where I can hand it off as a template so that others can use yeah. it. That's what we're supposed to be working on this whole year. And um, one of the things I wanted to say about this as we've been talking, and first I, I wanna thank uh, Kelly and Amber because I've already jumped in on some of their stuff and I'm looking to you know, uh, embed it into some of the work that we're doing, so thank you very much. Um, but also one of the things I'm finding with our students at the 202 level, I've already had four students leave the 202 level, decide to do either a minor or a major in French and work on the project. Oh, because cool. they've gotten really excited about it and they want to continue it. Yeah. Um, two of the students have gone on to become teachers and I'm so excited about that, given the, the dearth of uh, K-12 teachers that we have. So, you know, I think it's stimulating a lot of things. Um, this idea that, you know, we need to not just criticize, but engage the fact that this is always already evolving and a negotiation of meaning, um, that that's very much the case. And you've helped me today in this dialogue to realize I had had a hypothesis uh, level that I had put on top of our book. It wasn't working for the 202 students, but I see now that if I can get that operating, then anyone who's using the materials and the template, we would be able to have a community of practice and right. discuss where there are issues, you know, uh, whether it's, it's a grammatical error or just a better idea. Right. Uh, so what I would say to that is a community of practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we're all about communities of practice yeah. at, at Coral, but yeah. they take curation. So curation is the centerpiece of what you guys are doing. Yeah. You're going to end up not just creating materials, but creating the, the, the community of practice. Uh -huh. Um, so, so Rachel had a follow-up question to the previous question for um, uh, for Kelly. Um, she wanted to know if those OPIs are conducted by you, and if the students need to pay, uh, or if the students have to pay to have it um, conducted by LTI. Yeah. No. Right now, I yeah. That that's a common question that we get. Um, no, there's three of us that are certified proctors, and I would say that a lot of that training has been very very helpful. Amber's been a part of that too and how we take those can-do statements and how we understand what's needed in terms of proficiency and especially ensuring that those activities, we have the activities actually labeled in sub-levels. And so it's not, so you're not just getting something that's novice, but you're getting something that's novice mid versus novice high versus intermediate low versus, so we use that language and that's very alive and well in the, in the actual repository. But to answer the question, we provide that as a service. Um, it is quite a service <laughs> in terms of workload of the faculty, but certainly for those, um, uh, for our teacher educators um, in French and German, um, where our faculty are not certified, we, um, they have to do the OPIC. So they call in and do it, yeah. And then um, we have also a question about um, the, how how Catherine and, and your team, how you found the native speakers that will interact with the students? Uh, for the teletandem, I used, um, I think it's called Uni Collaborate. It's, it's a, uh, comes out of Germany, I believe. And it's like a huge site for doing teletandem partnering. And that's how I found my Belgian partners. And otherwise, I work with a, uh, a group in Mali, the Mali English Practice Club, and they just want to have um, partners who speak English, trading English for French with them. But we also have a, a wonderful lab director who's done quite a bit in teletandem throughout the world. And I, I'm going to have um, Laura maybe talk to that. Yes, uh, Dr. Tony Brinkworth is the director of the World Studies Media Center and has worked diligently over the past five years in finding partner universities uh, with whom our language classrooms can collaborate. 
Uh, our biggest partner right now is um, uh, La Universidad uh, Nacional Autónoma de Hidalgo and uh, our Mexican, our, our English speaking students are matched up with their Mexican students to have uh, a real life uh, and real time conversations back and forth. Again, half of the time in English and half the time in Spanish in one classroom session. Are those in audio only or also um, audio and visual? Audio and visual and the platform is Skype. Okay. Then there was also for the same um, process, there was a question about the upper level students. Um, how do you involve those? Um, Is it part of their coursework? Are they paid? We have gotten uh, money. We've probably managed to pull in around the university uh, close to $50,000 in monies to pay students. Uh, so we've had those kind of monies and, and also to pay some of the faculty. Um, but we also can use federal work study money to, to hire the students as research assistants. So they're research and development assistants and they're paid through the federal work study program through our university. Um, and then we also have two different kinds of courses. We have uh, an, a, a sort of an intern or experiential learning course that they can take if they'd rather have credit. And some students would rather have credit than get paid money. Yeah. And so those students will either take the internship or the independent study. And so we've been able to hobble together, getting some kind of compensation for the students. And one student just does it because she loves it. Yeah. And, and this is an example of having enough options to meet the student need, which is very individual. Right. Yeah. This way we're, we're, we're engaging different students with different needs with this mm -hmm. project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a, a general question for both of you, both of your projects, and that is about open copyrights, mm. the actual licenses that appear, because if you're involving lots of students, um, they often don't understand the ins and outs of copyright. And an OER isn't an OER unless it has an open copyright, an open license. So can you tell me how you guys handle the whole issue of open licenses? Carl, I would say that fa most faculty don't know how that actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to jump in and, and yeah, answer this one. So um, this is, it's definitely been a learning process. And, and I, I feel like we have reinvented the wheel five times over because we started and we made all these wonderful activities, but then we didn't think about copyright. So we had these great images and we'd have like oh, right. commercials and newspaper ads yeah. and all kinds of this stuff. And then a lot of that, unfortunately, had to be redone because we didn't think about it. So yeah. those of you who are listening in, to really take this, take this to heart because you can save yourself so much time. Um, but what we did is we really went through and we just provided resources for the students. And, and we, I'd be happy to share this with anyone. It's on, our, it's on our website. It's on our yeah. uh, repository. It's on our repository. We have yeah. a list of um, design resources. Um, but that's what I tried to do is really get in front of it and say, okay, not, not say like, this is not what, this is not what you can't do. This is what you can do. These are the sites that you can use. Mm -hmm. um, and really it's been so great because it, it makes students also be really purposeful when they're looking at images mm -hmm. rather than just going to Google images. Yeah. Um, we're really trying to encourage them to find um, diverse images to yes. really not to represent right. all students, not just one profile type of student to represent all French speaking countries, for example, so not just France. So do you train the students to actually look for open content, not just do a Google yes. search, but to look for yes. open images and open, yeah, yes. okay, good, yes. great. Yeah, so they, they, they learn about that from the asset part of it, so in terms of the photos, video, audio that we're including in our resources, but then they also learn how what licenses to apply to their own work, and that's right. gonna depend, like um, one of our graphic design students, she is giving um, people permission to use, but not to modify, and she, right. she made that choice. Whereas with our activities, we're giving the option for people to use and modify, but not use for commercial use. So yeah, we train the students in that, but I have lots of resources and, I, and I'd be happy to share that with anyone who's interested. Good. Uh, this is me, Guidarelli. I'm sorry, I'm an adjunct faculty, but also my full-time job is that of a librarian. And in our libraries, we do have a staff of two people so far, two librarians totally dedicated to the issue of copyrights to advise our faculty. Of course, we have at the very top 
a some kind of counselor, legal counselor for the whole university, but within the library, we have two librarians totally dedicated to the question of copyrights and the creation of OERs. Okay. So and they, and we have really, we, they create libguides just for copyright right. issues and creative comments that all can think of what we think of copyrights. And thank you, thank you for saying that. I wanna do a shout out to all librarians because <laughs> yes. there are people at uh, listening in thinking, how can I possibly do this? Go and meet your librarians because they understand the ins and outs of OER and open copyright. So I mean, it used 20 years ago, we thought, oh, the digital is going to kill the libraries. Not at all. It, have, the libraries are more active and vital to scholarship than ever, but it's all digital and now it's all open. So yes. librarians are keys to all these projects. Yeah. Having students understand copyright yes. yeah. restrictions and opportunities in and of itself is a skill. Right. Yeah. It's yes. digital literacy. Yeah. Digital right. literacy. Yeah. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there is a, a comment from Bridget Mariano uh, from, I guess, the Vir uh, Virginia Department of Education, I guess, um, is about to launch the Go Open Virginia repository for PK through 12 districts in Virginia. And they want to, they would like to reach out to both of your teams and potentially fold your work into the state level repository. The repository may act as a great bridge between you and the secondary students who might ultimately attend VCU and participate in your 202 courses. Which is um, exactly some of what's been happening. We have a couple of teachers who have seen us present at the Foreign Language Association of Virginia, and they've started doing curating. And so they connect into our curations with their students. And we've been going out into the uh, uh, high schools and talking to students about how to be a good language learner and what what they need to do to prepare to continue their language learning at the college level whether they come to VCU or go somewhere else and so we show them some of the curations and they will they will already start participating before they even come that's great right. um, I think previously there was a question about the um, if if the introductory, the unit zero was in the target language or in the L1? It's in both. Uh, when In the book itself, it's in target language because that's where we're starting. Um, but I have it in translation in an appendix. So if there are students whose skills are maybe not up to quite understanding that topic or all of the different topics that we cover which include copyright uh, that they can then go and, and at least get some scaffolding through the, the english and then come back to the target language yeah she was uh, wondering if they were able to use uh, to manage learning to use ict in the target language yeah, yeah. okay um so natalie i see we're coming up on the hour it's yes. time um I guess I, I want to try to wrap things up, but then bring in kind of last concluding comments from both of our teams. Um, I've been doing, talking about OER for, at Coral now for 10 years and more than that. But anyhow, I've noticed that there is a shift going on. When we started this, um, many people didn't, hadn't heard of, about open education, but more than that, they were, they were surprised when we were talking to the teachers in particular about developing their own materials and often I would get the remark, well, I'm a teacher, I'm not a textbook author, as though those two things were completely divorced from each other. And I would say, well, you create all kinds of materials. You do quizzes and you do activities and you do syllabi, da, 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 da. Um, but more and more, I find that people are much more open to creating materials and um, maybe not to the extent that the two, of, that, that your two teams have taken on because that, it is, it is a big, uh, it takes, it's very time consuming. Mm -hmm. But um, what, I, I guess to, to both of you, what would you tell people who are thinking about what kind of tips or ideas can you give to people who are contemplating jumping into the wonderful world of OER, making their own materials? So Kelly and Amber, how about you guys thinking that first? 
I would say start small. I think that's the advice that Kelly and I have often gave when we, we love to work with in integrating educational technology into the classroom and we always have overachievers. We always have instructors who are like, I'm going to redesign my whole course or I'm going to do, I'm going to incorporate 10 apps into my classroom this, this um, academic year. And I think that even if you just think of, is there one activity that you have that's maybe special, something different, maybe start with that one activity and see if you can find a place on OER Commons, on one of these existing repositories to share your work and get feedback. There's, you don't have to host your own website. That's what's so cool about a lot of these repositories is there's plenty of places for you to share your work, get feedback, and maybe even collaborate with people and, and see if they can adapt your work for different audiences or even different languages. But I think just starting small um, and, and being iterative, getting feedback and making changes um, uh, throughout the semester or throughout throughout the year, it's going to help you to be much more successful. Um, versus if you try to if you try to bite off too much, you're you're going to you're going to be pressured and you're not and you and you 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 might not complete the goal that you set out to to to, to do. Yeah, right. and then I would um, just say really quickly for me as a professor here, it's been really a social justice issue. I think it really matters to me about extending what we think about diversity and inclusion and intercultural competence even and bringing those student voices into the mix it provides a different perspective that's been missing often from the very textbooks from which we use things like images word choice mm -hmm. um, media interests all of this students have a role they have a place and when we engage with them not just in this these traditional teacher student relationships we miss out on the true meaning of why we're educators which is to impact lives and to really bring uh, language in, into a, a heart issue right and so that it impacts people and their community and um, those relationships by co-constructing uh, really I think it's such a point of departure to know your students and to engage them in in the learning process from a place of agency and to empower them in that process so that for me I think is what continues the drive when on the day when I feel a little bit overwhelmed maybe from the process and from curating and um, that that mission is really deep uh, to near and dear to my heart so Great, thanks. Yeah. What about uh, VCU? Well, I think ours has been about a community of practice, and I think good teaching and learning is good sharing. And we get so excited when somebody brings in something that they've created, um, and we look at it, and then we start figuring out how we're going to turn that into something we use in, in our class, our particular language. And it's just an excitement. We're always talking about stealing each other's ideas, but in the sense that, you know, it's, it's not stealing, it's sharing, it's caring. And, uh, and we, really, we really have a great community. And I think that's been, I think it's given all of us, you know, as, times get hard and there are always difficulties at universities we share the the really good stuff and we share the pain as well so we're very supportive and it's all about community so that's kind of to circle back to well, what Craig, that's doing. perfect to end on because it's true this is about community building and so if there are those people listening in thinking maybe should i do if you're contemplating it you should jump in and talk to members of the community and they will help you so Go small, start small, but also realize that there are people there to help you. So um, I want to just mention here the last slide. <clears throat> we have an entire course here at Coral for OER to teach people about OER, including those licenses. Um, Sarah has really developed an, in an incredible curriculum that has activities and uh, you can test your competency about, uh, about your knowledge of OER. So take a look at that. Um, we also have our own learn community, which are uh, open educators who are developing materials in different ways. Uh, we'll give you badges for different kinds of particip participation in our community. And your students can get badges too. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Now that they are actually OER developers, they can get badges. Um, and finally, um, since all of this is funded by taxpayer money, you pay for this, we, we need to give back to the federal government, let them know what you got out of this. Um, so would you just take, it takes literally five minutes to click on these buttons, but we have the, uh, the OER Hangout survey. You see the URL there. So if you don't mind writing it down or typing it in. I, uh, I also pasted it in the chat. 
and all the links are pasted in the it. chat. It's easy to go to the chat and just simply click on it and that will uh, take you to our online survey. So thanks again to both teams, um, Boise State and VCU. You guys are doing really cool things and uh, let's just stay in touch because that's what we're doing is trying to build, build a larger OER. Okay, so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.